We are able to study the electronic structure of atoms by looking at how different molecules and atoms interact with electromagnetic radiation, or in other words, how they interact with light. We will see that electrons live in energy levels. The lowest energy level an electron can live in is called the ground state. If an electron gains energy, it can jump up from that ground state to some higher excited state. This is called absorption. Once the electron relaxes, it can fall down from the excited state back to a lower level or back down to the ground level. This process is called emission. We know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So once an electron gains energy, it must also eventually give back down that energy. We also previously learned that energy is quantized. E equals H nu. That means that the energy that can be gained or lost is going to be fixed to discrete levels. Any amount of energy can't be gained. And any amount of energy can't be released when the electron falls back down. Only specific discrete amount that correspond to the transitions from different states of the electron can occur. You may have seen an experiment like this before, where different salts are dissolved in an alcohol such as methanol and then lit on fire. The flame provides energy to excite the electrons in the different ions to jump to higher energy levels. Usually it's the metal ion that's giving off the color that we see in the visible region. But this is kind of like a fingerprint for that particular element. The color that you're observing is due to the emission of the electron falling from a higher energy level down to a lower energy level. Something that was really important in learning about our quantum mechanical model of the atom was the existence of a line spectrum. If we were to look at the sunlight through a prism and separate it into its component wavelengths, we would see all of the colors of the rainbow. This is called a continuous spectrum. It contains a continuous unbroken distribution of light of all colors. But if we were to look at an element and it was given some energy, usually in the form of a spark, and we look at it through a diffraction grating, we would only see that it has very specific discrete lines that show up, hence why it's called a line spectrum. Other terms that are used are called atomic emission spectrum as well. This is like a fingerprint for the element. Each element has its own unique emission spectrum and its own lines that can be observed. Some are very simple and only have a few lines, whereas some elements have tons of lines and it's quite hard to decipher between them. In the laboratory, we are going to use a device called a spectroscope to actually see the line spectrum for different elements. Light will be emitted by the excited atoms and formed into a narrow beam that will be passed through a prism. The prism will divide the light into a few narrow beams with frequencies that are characteristic of the particular element that is emitting the light that we're seeing. Therefore, that line spectrum will be a fingerprint for whatever element we're observing. At the very top, we see a continuous visible spectrum that would be produced by the sun or something like an incandescent lamp. Sodium, on the other hand, has quite a few lines, but most of them are very dim and you can't see them all. The two major ones appear on the yellow region. For hydrogen, notice there are four lines in the visible portion of its line spectrum that we can see. Hydrogen also has other emissions that are in the ultraviolet and in the infrared portion of the spectrum, but we can't actually visualize those lines. We know that when an atom absorbs energy, the electron is raised to a higher energy level. And then when the electron falls to a lower energy level, light of a particular energy and frequency is emitted. This light corresponds to a specific color in the visible region. These are the four different lines that we can see for hydrogen, one at 410 nanometers, one at 434 nanometers, one at 486 nanometers, and one at 656 nanometers. All of the transitions that are in the visible region correspond to the electron falling to the second main energy level. So one is starting at six and falling to two, one is starting at the fifth energy level and falling to the second, one at the fourth, to the second and one at the third to the second main energy level. Electrons in a hydrogen atom can have other transitions rather than just falling to the second energy level. 
and there's different names that correspond to these transitions. If they fall to the n equals 1 energy level, they're called the Lyman series. The Balmer series is when electrons fall to the second main energy level. This is the one that corresponds to the visible region. The Passion series is when we have transitions that fall to the n equals 3 energy level. And the Bracket series is when we have transitions that fall to the n equals 4 energy level. The higher that the electron starts and the lower that it falls to, it will emit a greater amount of energy because the energy gap, or delta E, will be greater. The Rydberg equation was the first equation that allowed us to calculate all of the wavelengths for hydrogen spectral lines. It didn't matter if they were in the visible region, the infrared region, or the ultraviolet region. The Rydberg equation says that 1 over the wavelength is equal to r sub h, which is the Rydberg constant, times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. The Rydberg constant is 1.097 times 10 to the positive 7th inverse meters, or meters to the minus 1. n1 and n2 are whole numbers because they're energy levels. n2 is always greater than n1. The values for n will correspond to the allowed energy level changes that electron transitions can undergo. n1 will represent the inner energy level, or the lower energy level that the electron is falling to. n2 will represent the outer higher energy level, where the electron is starting at. What is the wavelength of light in nanometers that is emitted when an excited electron in the hydrogen atom falls from the n equals 5 energy level down to the n equals 3 energy level? So the Rydberg equation is 1 over lambda is equal to Rh times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. 1 over lambda will be equal to 1.097 times 10 to the positive 7th inverse meters, that's the Rydberg constant, times 1 over n1 squared, which since n1 is our inner energy level, that'll be 3, minus 1 over n2 squared, which would be our outer energy level. In this example, the higher energy level is 5. So we'll have 1 over 5 squared. Notice that we're calculating at first 1 over the wavelength. We're going to have to take the reciprocal after in order to get the wavelength alone. So 1 over lambda should be equal to 7.80 times 10 to the negative 10 to the positive fifth. And the units will be inverse meters. This was the units that we saw on the Rydberg constant. Nothing else has units, so the units are going to carry through. And then to calculate the wavelength, we'll take the inverse of that number. So 1 over 7.80 times 10 to the positive fifth inverse meters will equal our wavelength in meters, which is 1.28 times 10 to the negative six meters. Lastly, the problem asks us to convert our wavelength into units of nanometers. The meter is the larger unit, so we'll put that on the bottom. One meter is one times 10 to the ninth nanometers. Our meters are going to cancel, and that will give us 1.28 times 10 to the third nanometers. And this transition must not be in the visible spectrum because the visible spectrum ranges from about 400 on the violet end up to 700 on the red end nanometers. So we're outside of that visible spectrum portion. And when we have an energy, an electron falling to an n equals 2 energy level, normally that corresponds to one that we can actually see inside of the visible region. Calculate the wavelength in nanometers for a photon emitted if an electron in the hydrogen atom falls from the n equals 4 to the n equals 2 energy level. And what color of light does this correspond to? 
So once we actually know what the wavelength of light is, we can compare it to our visible spectrum. We're going to use the Rydberg equation to calculate the wavelength. 1 over lambda is equal to r sub h times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Therefore, if we plug in the Rydberg constant, 1.097 times 10 to the positive 7th inverse meters times 1 over n1 squared, and n1 will be our inner energy level, or our lower one, so that'll be 1 over n2 squared minus 1 over our outer energy level, which is 4, so 1 over 4 squared. If we calculate 1 over our wavelength, we're going to get a unit of inverse meters. And so we should get 2.06 times 10 to the positive 6 meters to the minus 1. To calculate our wavelength, we'll take the reciprocal of that number. So 1 over 2.06 times 10 to the 6 inverse meters will give us our wavelength, which should be 4.86 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Next, we'll convert our wavelength into units of nanometers. One meter is a billion nanometers, so we'll multiply by one times 10 to the ninth. Our meters will cancel, and our wavelength in nanometers will be 486 nanometers. Next, we want to look at the visible spectrum and find where this falls. We can see that 486 will probably fall right about here. So the color of the line that we would see would be green. The lines that were viewed in the atomic spectra for different elements were quite significant because they confirmed that energy was quantized. They told us that only fixed amount of energy can be lost or gained. Or in other words, only certain energy photons would be emitted when an electron fell from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, and that the electrons must be restricted to certain fixed energy levels within the atoms. The very first theoretical model of the hydrogen atom that successfully accounted for the Rydberg equation was proposed by a physicist named Niels Bohr. The Bohr model proposed that electrons lived in orbits that circled the nucleus. Each orbit had its own fixed energy, and the electron could jump from one orbit to a higher orbit. The analogy to the Bohr model is much like how planets move around the sun in fixed orbits. That is what he believed electrons were doing in their energy levels around the nucleus. This model led Bohr to an equation that described the energy of electrons in the atom. The energy of the electron could be calculated as E equals negative B divided by N squared. N was called a quantum number. And the quantum number represented the energy level. The first energy level was called n equals 1. The second energy level was called n equals 2. b is a constant, and it has the value of 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. By using this equation, we could calculate the energy of any electron in the hydrogen atom. Because of the negative sign in the equation, the lowest or most negative energy value occurs when n is equal to 1. This corresponds to the first orbit. The lowest energy state of an atom is its most stable one. So whenever you hear lowest energy, you should always associate that with most stable. This is the one that we refer to as the ground state. When an electron is in its ground state, it's the most stable because it's closest to the nucleus, and the positive and negative charges can have stabilizing interactions. When a hydrogen atom absorbs energy, as it does when an electric discharge is passed through it or if we use the flame from a Bunsen burner, the electron is raised from an orbit of n equals 1 
or what we refer to as the ground state, to some higher energy level. The electron could jump up to the n equals 2 energy level, the n equals 3, or maybe even the n equals 4 energy level. The higher orbits are less stable than the ground state, and so the electron is going to fall back down to a lower orbit. When the electron falls back down to a lower energy level, that's when we see the emission of light. Since the energy of the electron in a given orbit is fixed, a drop from one particular orbit to another orbit will always release the exact same amount of energy. So for example, say that we have an electron that absorbs some energy and it jumps up from the n equals 1 to the n equals 2 energy level. When the electron relaxes, it's going to fall back down from the n equals 2 to the n equals 1. The transition from n equals 2 down to n equals 1 will always release the exact same amount of energy. The energy, or delta E, the change in energy, can be calculated by taking the energy of the higher orbit minus the energy of the lower orbit. Every time an electron falls from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, a photon is emitted. That photon is what we were seeing when we looked at the line spectra. The Bohr model unfortunately only worked for hydrogen or atoms that had one electron. The Bohr model successfully accounted for the changes that occurred between energy levels and was able to account for the Rydberg equation. It also explained the line spectrum that were seen for different elements. Even though the Bohr model failed for multi-electron atoms, the concepts of quantum numbers and fixed energy levels were important steps forward in understanding quantum theory. Earlier, we learned that electromagnetic radiation doesn't only act as waves. They could also act as small particles known as photons. A scientist named Louis de Broglie said, if that waves can act like particles, why can't small particles such as electrons act like waves? He suggested that the electron not be considered as a particle, but rather as a circular standing wave. The wave could only have an integer number of wavelengths that could fit within the orbit. Thinking about the electron as a standing wave instead of a particle leads naturally to quantum numbers. The only waves that can occur are those for which a half wavelength that's repeated exactly a whole number of times can happen because the end is fixed. If we look at our example, from here to here we have one whole wavelength, from here to here we have one whole wavelength, here to here there's three, four, five, and six. Going around the circle, we had to have an integer number or six whole wavelengths. By now we understand that the classical physics that governs macroscopic objects cannot be used for very small things such as atoms and molecules. It just doesn't work. Erwin Schrodinger is a physicist who is credited as being the father of quantum mechanics. He described electrons as three-dimensional stationary waves or wave functions. The electrons are still seen as particles, not just waves. And so the waves represented by psi, this is the Greek letter psi, are not physical waves, but are considered probability amplitudes. Therefore, if we take the magnitude and square it of the wave function, that tells us the probability of a particle being in a certain location in 3D space. We can never say where an electron is with 100% certainty. We can only say where we think there's a high probability of finding an electron within an atom. Schrodinger developed an equation that can be solved to give wave functions. And the wave functions can be used to describe the shape of the electron wave and its corresponding energy. This is just one form of the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation describes the motion and behavior of systems on the subatomic and atomic levels, so very small, using that wave function psi. Here's another version of the Schrodinger equation, which is a partial second differential equation. We can see that it gives us information about the position. There's x, y, and z coordinates in here. And it also gives us information about the energy 
of the electrons within the atom. The wave function psi will tell us important information about the shape of the electron wave and the energy of the electron wave. Those are going to be the two properties that we care about the most. Schrodinger's equation can be solved to give wave functions and energy levels for electrons that are inside of atoms. The wave functions are referred to as orbitals now. That's why when we were looking at the Bohr model, we called them orbits to distinguish them from the proper term that's used today, which is orbitals. An orbital is a 3D region of space where we can say there is a high probability of finding at most two electrons. So no more than two electrons can occupy any orbital. Three-dimensional electron waves, or in other words, orbitals, can be characterized by a set of three different quantum numbers. The quantum numbers are n, which represents the principal quantum number, l, which is the secondary quantum number, and m sub l, the magnetic quantum number. There is a fourth quantum number that we'll talk about in depth a little bit later called the electron spin quantum number, or m sub s. Let's look at what each quantum number tells us about the electron in the atom and what type of numerical values they can have. So for the principal quantum number, we said that the symbol was lowercase n, the numbers for the principal quantum number can be 0 all the way to infinity minus 1 because there is no number for infinity. So it could be values like 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. The principal quantum number tells us the shell number. The shell kind of comes from an early notation where atoms were thought to be similar to ions and were layered around the nucleus in shells. It also tells us the distance the electron lives from the nucleus. So the higher the principal quantum number, the farther the electron is from the nucleus and the higher in energy it is. The secondary quantum number, or the angular momentum quantum number, uses the symbol cursive lowercase l. L is going to be dependent upon what n is. L can be whole numbers that range from 0 all the way to n minus 1. So if we have a quantum number for n that is 1, our L can only be 0. Or if we had a quantum number for n that was 2, our L could be 0 and 1. So L is directly dependent upon n. The angular momentum quantum number tells us the subshell. It also tells us the shape of the specific orbital that the electron lives in. We will talk about what those shapes are a little bit later. The third quantum number is called the magnetic quantum number, and its symbol is m sub l. The magnetic quantum number directly depends upon the angular momentum quantum number. m sub l can be integers, so positive or negative, and it will range all the way from negative l through zero up to positive L. So for example, if we had an L equal to 1, the values we could have for our M sub L would be negative 1, 0, and positive 1. The M sub L tells us the orientation of the orbitals in 3D space. So for example, if you imagine you have x, y, and z coordinates, having three values for M sub L tells us that each one of those will lie on one of those axes. And the last quantum number is the spin quantum number. Its symbol is m sub s. Our spins can only be one of two values. They can either be negative one half, which would represent spin down, and we often use a down arrow to represent negative one half, or plus one half, which is called spin up. So we draw an up arrow to represent that. This simply tells us the spin of the electron. The energy level, or the shell, are orbitals that have the same value of n, or the same value for the principal quantum number. If n equals 1, we call that the first shell, or the first main energy level. If n equals 2, we call that the second shell, or the second main energy level. A subshell are orbitals that have the same value for n and the same value for l. So they have the same principal quantum number and the same secondary quantum number.
that would mean that those orbitals live within the same subshell. So for example, if we have n equal to 1 and l equal to 0, this is called a 1s subshell. There's only one orbital that is within the 1s subshell. Or if we have n equal to 2 and l equal to 1, this is called a 2p subshell. Within any p subshell, there are three orbitals we'll see. The quantum numbers tell us a lot of useful information. They tell us how many orbitals of a certain type will be within a given subshell. They also tell us how many different types of subshells will be found within a main shell. We can use this information to figure out how many electrons could possibly live within a given main energy level, or in other words, how many electrons can be held within each shell. If we start with n equals 1, the values that we could have for L were directly dependent upon N, or the principal quantum number. L could be whole numbers that ranged from 0 all the way to N minus 1. So if N is 1, the only possible value for L is 0. So we're not using two numbers for N and L. L is given a letter designation. When we have an L of 0, that corresponds to S. And since our only possible m sub l value is also 0, because m sub l depends upon l, and it ranges from negative l through 0 up through positive l, the only value we can have there is 1. The fact that we just have one value there tells us that we only have a one orbital within that given subshell. And we learned that each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. Therefore, in the first main energy level, or the first shell, we can only have a maximum of two electrons because there's only one s orbital inside of that shell. When we move on to the second value for n, or n equals 2, now we can have two possible values for l. It still will range from 0 to n minus 1, but we could have 0 and we can have 1. We said that 0 corresponded to s and L of 1 corresponds to the letter P. So now within the second main energy level, we can have an s subshell and we can have a P subshell. For our s subshell, where L is equal to 0, the only possible m sub L value is still 0. So we have one value listed here that corresponds to just one s orbital within that subshell. When l is equal to 1, that meant p. Within our p subshell, the possible m sub l values ranging from negative l through 0 to positive l are going to be negative 1, 0, 1. Here we have three values. It doesn't really matter what those numbers are. We're just counting up how many values there were for the possible m sub l's. Those three values tell us that there's three orbitals within that subshell. So in the p subshell, there's three p orbitals, all of equal energy. Each one of those orbitals can hold two electrons. Therefore, in the p subshell, we can have a max of six electrons. If we add up the two electrons plus the six electrons in the second main energy level, we can have a total of eight electrons. Moving on to n equals 3, when the principal quantum number is equal to 3, that means we're in the third main energy level or the third shell, our possible, M, our possible L values will range from 0 to 1 to 2, so from 0 to n minus 1. 0, we said, corresponded to s, a value of 1 corresponds to the letter p, and a value of 2 corresponds to the letter d. The possible m sub l values will tell us how many orbitals live within that subshell. In any s subshell, we only had one value for m sub l, and therefore there was only one orbital. In any p subshell, our m sub l values will be negative 1, 0, and 1. Those three values always will correspond to there being three p orbitals within a p subshell. And when we have an L of 2, 
Now our m sub l values can be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. That's five values for the m sub l. Those five values mean that in any d subshell, there will be five d orbitals. So for the third main energy level, we can have two electrons in the s subshell, six electrons in the p subshell, and 10 electrons in the d subshell. If we sum all of those up, there can be 18 electrons in the third main energy level. The highest that we'll go is n equals 4. In the fourth main energy level, the values for L that we can have are 0, 1, 2, and 3. So 0 is S, 1 is P, we said 2 is D, and lastly, an L of 3 corresponds to the letter F. So in our 4S subshell, we can only have one value for the M sub L, therefore one 4S orbital. In our 4P subshell, P meant an L of 1, therefore our M sub L values were negative 1, 0, or 1. We had three values, so there would be three 4P orbitals in the P subshell. When L was equal to 2, that gave us five different values for the m sub l's, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Those five va values meant five orbitals, 5d orbitals. And if we have an l of 3, that corresponded to f, and that's going to lead to seven different values that are possible for our m sub l. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Those seven values mean that in any f subshell, there's going to be seven f orbitals. So our total number of electrons, when we sum up two electrons per orbital, would mean in the fourth main energy level, we can hold 32 electrons. This is how we use the quantum numbers to figure out which shell we're talking about, which subshell we're talking about, how many orbitals are within a given subshell, and then how many electrons we can fit. This graph shows a summary of what we were just going through on the last page. In any S subshell, there will only be one orbital, therefore a max of two electrons. In any P subshell, there will be three orbitals, each holding two, therefore a max of six electrons. In any D subshell, there will be five orbitals and a max of 10 electrons. In an F subshell, there will be seven different orbitals and there will be a maximum of 14 electrons. The first shell only holds one S subshell. The second main shell holds a one S and a two P subshell. The third shell holds a 3s, a 3p, and a 3d subshells. The fourth shell holds a 4s subshell, a 4p subshell, a 4d subshell, and a 4f subshell. And those all correspond to those max number of electrons that we calculated on the previous slide. Let's try using some of our new definitions, figuring out stuff about orbitals, shells, and subshells. How many orbitals are there in a subshell designated by the quantum numbers n equals 3 and l equals 2? If we're figuring out how many orbitals, the quantum number m sub l tells us that. m sub l, we get a certain number of values for. Those values correspond to a number of orbitals within a subshell. And m sub l directly depends upon l. So if l is equal to 2, what are our possible m sub l values? Well, m sub l ranges from negative l up through positive l. So m sub l could be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. Counting these up, we can see that we have five values for m sub l. Those five values correspond to five orbitals. In this case, those five orbitals would be the 3d orbitals. For the second one, how many subshells are there in the energy level or shell designated by n equals 3? So when we want to figure out how many subshells there are, that's directly asking us about the L values.
What are our possible L values? Well, L is directly dependent upon N. And L can go from 0 all the way to N minus 1, we learned. So in this case, L can go from 0 to 2. Our values for L will be 0, 1, or 2. And we gave those some letter designations to help, help differentiate them from our N values. 0 meant S, 1 meant P, and 2 meant D. So how many subshells are there in an energy level of N equals 3? There are three subshells. We have a 3S subshell, a 3P subshell, and a 3D subshell. Notice that the main energy level also tells you how many subshells are in it as well. So when n equals 1, there's only one subshell. When n equals 2, there's two subshells. And when n equals 3, there was three subshells. What is the total number of orbitals in the energy level designated by n equals 4? If n equals 4, we want to ask ourselves, what are our possible L values first? Because that'll tell us how many subshells there are. So our values for L could be 0, 1, 2, or 3 when n equals 4. So L ranged from 0 to n minus 1. And we know that those correspond to S, P, D, and 3 was F. We could figure out the m sub l values for s, p, d, and f separately, but if you recall, the number of orbitals within any s subshell is equal to 1. The number of orbitals within any p subshell was 3, and we got that from negative 1, 0, and plus 1. The number of orbitals in any d subshell was 5. That was from negative 2 negative 1, 0, 1, and plus 2. And then in any F subshell, there was seven values for M sub L. So there's seven orbitals in any F subshell. So if we add up all of those orbital numbers, how many there are, that'll give us the total number of orbitals in the fourth main energy level. So that should be 16 orbitals. Identify the shell and subshell of an orbital with the quantum number n equals 3 and l equals 1. And this is essentially just using notation, subshell notation to say what specific subshell we're talking about. And how we do that is first we write the main energy level or the n value, so that would be 3. And then l corresponds, an l of 1 corresponds to p. So we list the L value second. So the shell and subshell with the quantum numbers 3, n equals 3 and L equals 1, is a 3P subshell. The nice thing is you don't have to memorize all of this information. We can use the periodic table to help us assign quantum numbers for an electron in any atom. N, or the principal quantum number, is related to the period number on the periodic table. For something called the S block and the P block, N will be equal to the period number. And if you recall, the period number is the horizontal rows of the elements. When we're in the D block, N is equal to the period number minus 1. And when we're in the F block, N is equal to the period number minus 2. The quantum number L is related to a specific block of elements in the periodic table. For groups 1A and 2A, L is equal to 0. This is the S block. For groups 3A through 8A, L is equal to 1. This is referred to as the P block. For our transition metals, L is equal to 2. This is referred to as the D block. And for those inner transition metals that are below the periodic table, L is equal to 3 anywhere there. This is called the F block. M sub L will refer to two different columns within a block. So two columns will equal one orbital. 
and m sub s will refer to one of those two columns for the m sub l. For one of the m sub l's, plus one half will fill, and for one of the other m sub l's, negative one half will fill. If we look at our periodic table, we can predict the four quantum numbers for any particular electron. So groups 1a and 2a would be over here, and this would be our s block. So an electron that's over here is going to be in an s orbital. In this region, the n value is directly equal to the period number. So if we're in the first row, n is equal to 1. If we're in the second row, n is equal to 2. The third row, n is equal to 3. The first column is going to be an m sub l of equal to 0. The second column is also going to be an m sub l equal to 0. 0 is the only value we can have for our m sub l when l is equal to 0. And there's a rule that says, an electron cannot have all four same quantum numbers. Therefore, the spin is what differentiates between the two quantum numbers in this S block. The first column we say has spin plus one half, and the second column has spin negative one half. And this is actually where helium would be. So we can kind of think of helium as floating for now. Let's move over to the P block. So this is going to be groups 3a through 8a over on the right hand side and in the p block l is always equal to 1. in the p block n is equal to the period number therefore in row 2 the period number is going to be 2 and so our second energy level is where we would be in row 3 n is equal to 3 Row 4, n is equal to 4. Our m sub l values, we know when l equals 1, can range from negative 1 to 0 to 1. And so the very first column all the way down will be negative 1. The second column all the way down will be 0. The third column all the way down will be plus 1. And each one of those represents one electron going in. Then those values repeat themselves. We know that we can hold six electrons in our three orbitals. The negative one, zero, and one correspond to each of those three orbitals in the P block. So the second of them is going to be filling them completely. So we have negative one, zero, and then plus one all the way down those columns. The first three columns, we would say all the electrons have a spin of plus one half. And then for the second three columns, those electrons would have a spin of negative one half. Moving over to the D block, those are going to be where our transition metals are. If we're in the D block, the L value is always equal to two, and N is equal to the period number minus one in with the D block. So therefore, if we're in row 4, where n is equal to 4, our n value in the d block is actually 3. Or if we're in row 5, our n value is going to be 4. If we're in row 6, our n value will be 5. It's always the period number minus 1. And when l is equal to 2, we know we can have five values for m sub l. Those five values are ranging from negative two up to positive two. So the first five columns, we're gonna have negative two all the way down for our m sub l, negative one all the way down, zero, plus one, and then plus two. And then those five values will repeat. Negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. The first five, columns have a spin of plus one half or up spin. The second five columns have a spin of negative one half. Our last block is going to be the F block, which is the inner transition metals that are removed from the periodic table. So here's our F block. Anywhere in the F block, 
the L will be equal to 3. And for our principal quantum number, N will be equal to the period number minus 2. So this gets removed from right here on the periodic table. So this would be a period number of 6, whereas this row would be a period number of 7. So if we have a period number of 6 and the n value is the period number minus 2, this first row would be the 4 for our n value. And our second row would be 7 minus 2, which is 5 for our n value. And in the f block, since l is 3 everywhere, we're going to have 7 values for our orbitals. Each orbital can hold 2 electrons. So our range here, we're going to have negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then those values will repeat for the second electron that can fit in each orbital. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. The first electron in the orbital will have a spin of plus one half. That'll be the first seven columns. And the second seven columns, which represent the second electron going in to those orbitals, will have a spin of negative one half. So using this, you can look at the periodic table and figure out what the four quantum numbers for the last electron in any atom are going to be. So let's talk a little bit more about the spin quantum number, or m sub s. There's a principle called the Pauli exclusion principle that says no two electrons in the same atom can have the same set of all four quantum numbers. And if you notice, there will be two electrons that have the same first three quantum numbers, but then they differ on their m sub s. One electron will have a quantum number for m sub s of plus one half, and the other will have minus one half. We know we can only have a maximum of two electrons per orbital. So the only thing that will be different will be the m sub s value for two electrons that are living in the same orbital. We say that the two electrons have opposite spins, and those spins are paired. So plus one half we represent with an up arrow, and minus one half we represent with a down arrow. And when those two electrons are living in the same orbital, plus one half and minus one half, we say those spins are now paired up. We really only need three quantum numbers to describe where an electron lives in an atom. The spin is an intrinsic property of an electron. It arises out of the behavior of an electron in a magnetic field. A spinning charge acts a lot like a magnet. So we can think of electrons as tiny magnets. The electrons can spin in one of two possible directions. They can spin up or they can spin down. You can think about this like the north and south poles. So we have two possible values that we assign to represent the spin of those electrons. Either we assign them a positive one half or a negative one half. Using your periodic table, assign quantum numbers to the last electron in each of the following atoms. So you're going to want to keep your periodic table out next to you, and you might want to take out your periodic table where we determined our S block, P block, F block, etc. while you're practicing. So oxygen is our first one, and our block that oxygen is in is in the P block. Everywhere in the P block, L is equal to a value of 1. So P is the same thing as L equals 1. And when we're in the S or P block, the energy level is equal to the period number. And oxygen is in period number 2, therefore N will be 2. Our M sub L, that will correspond to the column that the oxygen's in. So remember, we have that repeating pattern of negative 1, 0, 1 negative one, zero, one. And oxygen falls within the column of negative one. And the spin, the first three columns will be plus one half, and the second three columns will be negative one half. So oxygen falls within the second three, the gr second grouping of three, so we'll give it a spin of negative one half. For magnesium, we are in the S block, and everywhere in the S block, L is equal to zero, 
for the S block, the period number is equal to the main energy level or the principal quantum number, and magnesium is in period number three, so our N value will be three. When L is equal to zero, M sub L can only be zero. So the first two columns are both zero, and the first column has a spin of plus one half, and the second column has a spin of negative one half, and magnesium's in that second column of the S block. Titanium. Titanium is in the D block, or the transition metals, and in the D block, L is equal to two everywhere in there. And in the D block, the principal quantum number is equal to the period number minus one. And so our period number where titanium is found is four, and so N will be three. And M sub L will determine what column it's in. We have that repeating fashion of negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. And titanium is under negative one. And our spin, the first five columns will be plus one half, the last five columns will be negative one half. Titanium falls within one of those first five columns, so a spin will be plus one half. Our last one is bromine. Bromine is in the P block, and so everywhere in the P block, block the quantum number L is equal to one. And the principal quantum number is equal to the period number, which bromine is in period number four. M sub L, we will have a repeating fashion of negative one, zero, one, and then negative one, zero, and one again. And so the halogens will all have an M sub L of zero. And our first three columns would be plus one half, and our last three columns would be negative one half. So we can look at the specific period, the specific block, and then the specific column that uh, atom is in in order to determine what the quantum numbers are for that last electron. Let's try another example. So using the periodic table, we want to assign quantum numbers to the last electron and the following atoms. And when we say last electron, what we mean is that final electron going in to make the atom. So for example, carbon is atomic number six, so we would say Z is equal to six. That means carbon has six protons and six electrons. When we assign these quantum numbers, we're not assigning them for the first five electrons, we're assigning it for that last sixth electron. So for carbon, carbon is in the P block, therefore L will be equal to one. The period number that it's in will be equal to the principal quantum number, and it's in period number two, so N is two. M sub L will be, it would go negative one first, and then zero, and carbon is the second column, so M sub L will be zero. And the spin is going to be plus one half for the first three columns in the P block. Next, potassium. Potassium is in period number four, and it's in the S block. So in the S block, the period number is equal to the principal quantum number. When we are in the S block, L is always equal to zero. When L is zero, M sub L can only be zero for the, both of the columns. And potassium is the first column, so we say its spin of the electron is plus one half. Copper. Copper is in the transition metal block. So in the transition metal block, L is equal to two, which is D. And our principal quantum number is equal to the period number minus one, and the period number is four, therefore N will be three. M sub L, we're gonna have that repeating fashion of negative two, which would fall over scandium, negative one over titanium, zero over vanadium, one over chromium, and two over manganese. That'll be the first five columns, then it'll repeat. Negative two over the column with iron, negative one over the column with cobalt, zero over nickel, plus one over copper, and then last it'd be plus two over zinc. So that plus one is over the copper. And then the M sub S, those first five were plus one half, and copper is in the last five columns of the D block, and so negative one half is its spin. Lastly, we have krypton. Krypton is in the P block, and in the P block, everywhere, L is one. In the P block, the principal quantum number is equal to the period number, and krypton is in period number four, so N is four. M sub L, it would be negative one, zero, one, 
and then negative 1, 0, 1. So that noble gases are going to have m sub l of 1. And since it's in the second of the three columns, it's going to be negative 1 half for the spin. So practice using your periodic table, and you could pick any atom and just assign four quantum numbers to the last electron for that atom.